Welcome to Energy Law with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about electricity regulation. Just going to do a very brief intro to the electricity system and then some of the animating principles for the regulation of the electricity system. So as a reminder, we talked about this Sankey diagram earlier in class where we talked about here on the left, where are the sources of power of energy that enter into the electricity system that's turned into electricity that we can all use in you know residential commercial or industrial uses and you see that uh, the biggest single source of energy comes from natural gas you see coal is another important source we see that uh, wind energy and solar energy and hydro are important and then we see that nuclear is important as well so those are sort of the inputs to the electricity system it all has to be turned into electricity so that we can use it for all the purposes that we use electricity for now, if we look at the historical development of the electricity system in the United States, we see that initially a lot of the electrification happened from hydro. So although a lot of those dams that we have in the US are very old, and so we'll have cases about their relicensing to let them operate more years, et cetera. But you can see that there was actually a lot of hydro uh, development. You see it continues through the 50s and 60s, but then we get other sources of power as well. And this really uh, ugly sort of brown color, we have coal. You can see a big uh, boom in those coal power facilities in the 70s and 80s. In orange, you can see natural gas, the huge boom in natural gas power plants in the uh, 2000s in orange. You can see that nuclear power really kind of starts coming on board in the 1970s and really you haven't had much uh, come on board since uh, 1990. We'll see wind power and solar power in green and yellow coming on uh, more recently. Um, you see there's not a lot of uh, petroleum power plants being built nowadays. You can see some of it was built uh, during the 1970s. Now if we look more recently, what kind of power sources are being built? I've shown you this chart before, and you've seen that if we lead up to 2020, we see mostly what's been built in the last 15 years is in light blue, natural gas power plants, in green, wind power, in yellow, solar power. That's what's above the line is what's been built. Then if we look at projections going forward, it's kind of more of the same. In light blue, natural gas, in green, wind power, in yellow, solar power. If we look at what's being shut down, we see in black a lot of coal. That's what's below the line. And we see more coal expected to be retired in the future with also some nuclear in red expected to be retired. Now, obviously, these trends principally towards more use of natural gas and renewables can be seen if you look at what kind of uh, power is generated. Where is the power that we use generated from. And I think it's most useful to look at this chart on the right. You see that falling share of coal power in brown that has fallen all the way down basically to 20% um, with a little recovery in 2021, you know, 21%. Uh, you can see that um, solar uh, power and uh, wind power, those non those uh, non hydro renewables rising in green to almost 15%. Um, and you can see natural gas in yellow rising to be our biggest uh, source of power, just over 35%, just under 40%. So that you can see that the two sources of energy that are on the rise are really those uh, renewables like solar and wind, those non-hydro renewables, and then uh, natural, natural gas. And you can see that coal, generally coal use, has been falling. So what's been driving these trends? Well, a couple of things. Some of them we've talked about already, but one of the principal drivers is price. And that's because um, renewables can often be the cheapest source of power when they're available. That doesn't mean they're the most valuable power source because they're so bountiful in some ways that power tends to be very cheap when they're available. So when power is most valuable is when they're not available and that can sometimes uh, hurt their economics. But if you were just going to go by what's the cheapest source for producing the most po power, what we sometimes call the levelized cost of electricity. To simplify, imagine you take the full power plant, what it costs to build it and keep it running, and uh, then you, you know, divide that um, by or you uh, take the amount of power it produces and divide it by that, how much 
power do you get you know, per dollar that you spend or how many dollars does it create, uh, does it cost you to produce a megawatt hour of power? And what you see here is that um, by that measure, solar photovoltaic you know, at a utility scale, those big solar farms, is one of our cheapest sources of power. You see onshore wind, also very cheap. You see that natural gas, can compete some of the time with those. There's overlapping ranges, but it's very difficult for some of those conventional sources like coal and nuclear power plants to compete. Now we've talked about, okay, well, if solar and wind tend to be the cheapest and they don't have emissions, why don't we just rely on those? Well, obviously, because then we wouldn't have power because often they're not providing any electricity at all. So, what, um, so in some ways, gas has the advantage of not just being cheap, you know, cheaper of these other sources, but being the cheapest of those reliable power sources that you can depend on. And so if you have a system of solar and wind and natural gas, in theory, they can work together with solar and wind providing power when they're available and natural gas providing uh, electricity to back it up. And it's hard for other sources of power, even if they can be reliable sources of power like nuclear to compete with that cheap mix of solar and renewables. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's you know fine if you're thinking about building a new power plant, so fine, don't build a new nuclear power plant. But surely we can at least keep our nuclear power plants running. Well, actually one challenge is solar and wind have gotten so cheap that sometimes it doesn't even, even if you've already spent all the money on the nuclear power plant, it may not make a lot of sense to keep that nuclear power plant running if the costs of solar and wind get very low. That's also true with coal power. That's why we see coal power shutting down. And so you can see this is the marginal cost of a coal and nuclear plant, which basically means not the cost to build a new one, but even if you already built the power plant, what's the cost to keep it running, to run that power plant? And you can see that sometimes wind, especially when it's subsidized, can undercut those costs. Right? It can be cheaper to run wind than even just to provide a little extra fuel to keep your coal power plant or your nuclear power plant running. And so that means that sometimes those coal and nuclear power plants, it's just not economic for uh, them to run because of how cheap solar and wind have gotten. And it's important to keep in mind that solar and wind are often getting uh, cheaper. They've gotten a little more expensive just in the recent years with pandemic supply chains. But we, you know, have, they have gotten much cheaper in the past and we expect them to continue to get cheaper. So over time, it's going to be harder and harder to justify running those old traditional power plants like coal power and nuclear power. And, you know, maybe we don't need them if we're happy with natural gas providing the backup. But as we'll see over the course, there are some problems with relying on natural gas as a backup, both from those who feel that, well, it doesn't, it uh, has more carbon emissions, certainly, than nuclear, as well as um, from, you know, those who look at the winter storm in Texas and say, well, you know, natural gas power plants um, also depend on sort of instantaneous supply of natural gas. And so can we really depend on them always being available? Okay, here's a way to look at that same question uh, regionally. And it's just important to know whenever you think about one of these electricity problems, um, electricity prices differ a lot across the United States. And so we can't just say, you know, always solar is cheaper, always wind is cheaper, always natural gas is cheaper. It depends a lot on what part of the country you are in, especially because as we talked about, electricity is very expensive to transport as is natural gas. And so you can get very different prices for natural gas and electricity around the country because it's not easy to just ship the natural gas or the electricity to the place that's experiencing high prices at the time. So if we look regionally, we can see that this map, it's a few years old now, is showing that wind power is the cheapest source of power in the center of the country, that solar is the cheapest in certain regions of the country here in purple, um, and then that you get natural gas, the cheapest source in the big regions of the country, sort of on the uh, southeast, on the west coast, and in, and in the northeast. Now that, you know, of course, can vary time to time and will change over time as well. But it's important to recognize that these are regional challenges. And if you divide the country into quarters by what source of power they use, we can see there's very different patterns around the United States. So, you know, for instance, um, coal power was never really a big part of the picture, or at least not in the last 10 years in um, 
in uh, some parts of the country, you know, like you can see the Northeast, it's really fallen very low. In other parts of the country, like the South, coal power used to dominate and has just you know, rapidly fallen away. In the Midwest, coal power still has an important role, but has also rapidly fallen. And then we can see that, you know, in the South, uh, this would include Texas, natural gas use has risen dramatically, taking over the, um, the role of coal. So we see that dramatic shift, the most dramatic shift really in, um, in power use happening here in the South, here in uh, Texas, with an important one happening in the Midwest as well. Okay, now as I said, electricity prices vary around the country. They vary a lot from time to time and moment to moment. So you can get very different prices. But even if we take the average electric rate, so we really, you know, we smooth out a lot of that variation. But if we take the average rate in each state, we see very different prices for electricity. So you can see Texas has pretty moderate prices for electricity. This is showing about 12 cents a, uh, a kilowatt hour. Uh, you can see that it's much higher in the Northeast. In California, we're getting prices about 21 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and then you can see there's really low prices, some places that have hydro, like in Washington and Idaho, uh, some places that have a lot of coal power, like Arkansas. Um, but I, the other thing I want you to note is that Electricity prices vary a lot, not just in the U.S., but across the world. And the U.S. in general has quite low electricity prices. So if you look at this map of electricity prices around the world, you see that the U.S. at 12 cents a kilowatt hour is very low in those prices, much lower than we see in Europe. Europe, and by the way, is now experiencing much higher electricity prices. Um, and, but you can see even you know at this time in Spain, they had high uh, prices in Germany and Denmark. Um, Japan, which has fewer natural resources, tends to have uh, higher electricity uh, prices as well. Okay, so the other thing I want you all to keep in mind is that, of course, when we look at these projections about the future, they're just projections and a lot of things can change. And, you know, in fact, projections have often been wrong in the past. So um, this is some of the projections that the U.S. Energy Information Administration gives in terms of where our electricity is going to come from in the future. You know, in the reference case, we see natural gas and renewables continuing to rise here on the left, coal continuing to fall off. Um, if oil and gas, for whatever reason, their, uh, our production of those was restrained, we would see less production from natural gas. And you would see um, renewables likely rise to fill the gap with coal also not falling quite so fast. On the other hand, if we had a lot of uh, oil and gas being produced in the future, we might get a little bit more natural gas and a little bit fewer renewables. So obviously, the future production of these resources and you know, innovation in producing them um, is going to have a big impact on future prices and how much we use of each of these sources. Okay, now it's just a very brief introduction to uh, electric, electric utility regulation. Historically, in the United States, the normal way that the electricity system was regulated was that there was one utility company that was responsible for every part of the electricity system. As we've talked about that electricity system uh, before, there are really um, several, uh, you know, several key parts. So one is that we have, uh, that's the upstream generation of electricity. Then two is we have transmission lines that carry that electric energy um, long distances at high voltage. Then three, we have that electricity at a transformer. Um, this basically solenoids that you see is stepped down to a lower voltage. So it then can be distributed on smaller lines to houses. But historically, all stages of this um, of this generation chain from the generation to the transmission to the distribution were done by one company and it would go to the government and say this is the rate i would like to charge for that electricity to pay me back for all the investments that i have made so you know you sometimes hear this called you know the regulatory compact etc um it is at issue in this case eagle point solar versus iowa utility board it's an Iowa Supreme Court case from 2014. It's on page 264 in your books. So what happens here is that Eagle Port Point Solar has agreed to install solar panels on a city building. And the city agreed to purchase the power. 
Okay, so remember, let's start for, you know, first principles. Why would we object to this? Eagle Point Solar, producing solar energy, isn't that great? And they're selling it to the city, isn't that great? Why would we interfere in this private market transaction? Well, the objection of the utility is, hey, wait a second. I have made billions of dollars of investments in these power plants, in transmission, in distribution to these houses. And the whole way that I get paid back for that is that everybody has to use power from me. And so when everybody has to use power from me, I get paid back for my investment. If they can just use their own system, I'm not necessarily going to get paid back. And you might say, well, you know, that's no big deal. But you've asked me to make all these you know, socially important investments, ensuring everybody's power never turns off and serving all customers. I have to have you know, special rules that protect those customers from having their power cut off, et cetera. And the deal was, in return, I have a monopoly in this area, and Eagle Point Solar is challenging that monopoly. Well, the Iowa Utilities Board agrees with that objection and says, look, that makes you a utility. If you're producing electric power and selling it to somebody else, you're a utility. Okay, so who cares? Why, why does that matter that they're a utility? Well, the reason is that the Iowa statute says that you're a public utility if you furnish uh, gas by pipe distribution system or electricity to the public for compensation. So seemingly by this definition, since Eagle Point Solar is providing electricity for compensation, it is a utility. And what Iowa law says is, you are not allowed to operate as a utility within another utility's area. So the, uh, so the regulated utility is the one that actually makes the investments. They're the only ones that gets to sell electricity in this area. Okay, that would seem to be relatively simple under the statute, but the Supreme Court of Iowa says, no, 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 it's not so simple. In fact, to see whether you're a utility, we're gonna apply an eight-factor test that looks at whether we really need to give you that exclusive territory to protect customers or reliability. And so that eight-factor test says, we're gonna look at what kind of transaction it is, the public, whether it's public use, is it an indispensable service, is there monopoly power, can you serve all customers, um, and competition with other utilities. Okay, spoiler alert, they say balancing these eight factors, Eagle Point Solar, not a utility, therefore it can continue to operate. Uh, you no, know, I think one thing that's interesting about this case is know that this is so different from the typical federal case we see where the federal court says, look, regulator, you're the expert here. We're going to defer to your judgment. Now, who's the regulator here? It's the Iowa Utilities Board. So each state typically has a utility regulation a regulator or the Public Utility Commission here in Texas. Iowa's is the Iowa Utilities Board, and they say, look, under the statute, you're a utility. And that actually kind of makes a lot of sense because that's effectively the statute just says if you sell electricity for compensation, you're a utility. But the court says, yeah, we don't care as much about the statute. We don't care about your expertise. We're concerned about these policy factors. There's an eight factor test, and this is how it applies. So that kind of sort of free floating public policy consideration um, is not something that the federal courts do as often, especially when it's opposed to what the regulators um, exercise of expertise. So I would just note that this decision is very interesting for Iowa law and some of the public policy considerations that one should consider and that maybe the Iowa Utilities Board should have considered, but it's a little bit uh, not the kind of typical analysis that you would see in federal court. Overall, the main point I want you to take from this case is how it represents this background understanding that a lot of times utilities are going to try to insist on, which is we make all these investments in this vertically integrated utility, i.e. we control every part of power production, transmission, and distribution. And as a result, we should have a monopoly uh, to serve customers. They shouldn't uh, be able to rely on independent sales of electricity because as a utility, we're serving important social goals and that shouldn't be undercut by private sales of electricity.